theater in the learning and certifications booth. I always love it when they put me on the first session of the day before the door opens. So don't worry about it. There's plenty of time. Come on in. We'll get started here with how to be a network engineer in a programmable age in just a couple of minutes. There's some seats up front a little bit. We do have a little bit of space here in the corner once the seats fill. This is always, it, it's so encouraging to me that even after talking automation for as long as I have, we still get so many people excited to hear the story about how to bring programmability into your job as a network engineer. So come join us, kick off. I also always appreciate this because I get to like clean up after Chuck's keynote, which is always a fun exercise as well. So come on in, excellent, excellent. All right, where'd my clicker go? All right, I think we're in good shape. There's still some folks coming in. If you didn't get a chance to get scanned, make sure you get scanned by one of our folks that are around. All right, are we ready? We good? Excellent, I got the thumbs up from Emma behind me. And so as I mentioned, welcome to the Cisco U Theater here on day two at Cisco Live. My name is Hank Preston. I'm a principal engineer in learning and certifications, and I'm excited to talk to you about how to be a network engineer in a programmable age. One of my favorite topics to talk about. And I really appreciate the fact that today, network engineering has gotten calmer than ever, right? Things are easy for us to take care of. There are no problems. We don't have to worry about much of anything as it goes through because things have just, my slides are not working. Come on. Oh no. There we go, we'll do it that way. All right, things have gotten so calm and easy in network engineering that we've all got all the time in the world to learn new skills. We can dive in, all the fires in the data center have stopped, right? We don't have any security problems going on. It's really appreciative that every problem in the world has ceased so that we can take a moment back and learn how to automate, learn how to deal with the programmability that's out there. Now, I know you all are smiling, so am I, because network engineering has not gotten any calmer. If anything, it's gotten more exciting because new things are coming at us constantly, left and right. But we still have to find the time to adjust and figure out how to evolve ourselves and keep up with the latest and greatest that's going on out there. And that's what today's talk is about, is to kind of explore how this thing fits into what we have to do on a daily basis. But it is an evolution. Right? We have been doing this for a long time. So let's start with a look back at the good old days of networking when networks were simple and we had routers and we had switches and we had servers and PCs that connected to our switches and things were so simple and easy. And we knew where the network was. We could walk into our data closets and we could actually touch our network. It was in racks or sometimes just in a closet next to the photocopier. And we could reach out and we could touch them and they were, they were teal green and they had Cisco silk screened on the front of it. And that was the network. We knew where it was, but it didn't stay quite that simple for very long. The network evolved and it evolved quickly. One of the first big changes we had is when the network started to evolve into virtual machines, right? Remember the first V switches you had to figure out how to connect to? This idea of actually putting tags and VLANs that went into a server and then there were more than one machine on a server that was out there. That was tough for us to deal with. And then the physical infrastructure, the compute actually started to change as well. And blade servers came out and blade switches were installed, which were, it was like a, 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 a problem for most network engineers that were out there because we didn't know how to handle these blade switches because sometimes they had different vendors names on them. They might say HP or Lenovo or Hitachi. And so nobody knew, is that really a switch or is that a piece of compute hardware? Who paid for it? Well, the network team doesn't wanna deal with it, but at the end of the day, that was still the network. And we also have all of the services we have to deal with, load balancers and firewalls and IPSs and lions and tigers and bears. Like there's so much in the network that we have to deal with and it just continues to grow. I would have been very happy if it just stopped here. I understood this. But the world continued to change. Cloud and containers started to come at us. And now not only did we have to deal with virtual machines that were nowhere near connected to a physical switch, we also had to deal with containers that lived inside of a virtual machine on this Linux bridge thing that was inside of our systems. But eventually they made their way to a physical network that we could talk to. And then the dreaded cloud came in, right? It was okay if I had a virtual machine and I could eventually see it on my network. But these cloud VMs, I don't get to touch their network, right? That's AWS's network or that's Google's network. 
what is a network engineer to do? I can tell you what we did. We focused on the one part of cloud networking that made sense to us all, the cloud exchange. I know how to do that. That's just an extension of the WAN. Give me a direct connection. That's the only part of cloud I want to deal with. We can't do that, though. We have to build networks that are for, throughout the environment, secure, reliable cloud networks that handle cases where maybe it's just services. It's a database as a service sitting out there that never touches anything remotely like a network switch that we have. Now, before we started kind of coming back in, this was kind of where I ended this. And then I recognized that it continues to evolve. The network continues to change on us. With the advent of cloud, we got things like overlays started to become more and more important. And then software-defined WAN came through. And each one of these evolutions brought us closer and closer to the programmable age, where software and manipulation through APIs were becoming more and more important. And it continues, right? Most recently, the latest things that go in, right? COVID, the lockdown, everything brought hybrid work to the forefront and new technologies like SASE and MFA that we had to deal with, full stack observability, right? I'm still not sure exactly what makes up the full stack, but I know I wanna see it, whatever's there, right? I wanna take a look at it, it's exciting. Cisco keeps telling me everywhere it's exciting, but nobody can tell me what makes up the full stack. Someday we'll learn, I'm sure. And then we've got infrastructure as code, right? So much is going on at us. Networking has been evolving for 30 plus years at this point. This year is actually the 30 year anniversary of the CCIE. How many CCIEs out there? A few hands, excellent. Happy anniversary to you all. Networking has been exciting and it has been evolving. And I like to look back again at the evolution of networking. Back to the good old days of the stone age where us network engineers only had to concern ourselves with two things, VLANs and spanning tree, right? That's all we had to care about right? How many VLANs and making sure spanning tree was configured? Because even back then in the Stone Age, we knew that if the network went down, it was a problem. But it was nice in the Stone Age because if something went down, it was still okay if it took 15 seconds for the network to come back and converge. We weren't in that big of a hurry. But eventually we went into the Middle Ages. The network started to span across the globe. We had to do WAN design. We had to partner with service providers. We had to figure out how to actually allow our customers, our users that are in one part of the globe to access systems in another part of the globe. We built global reliable networks and we did it really, really well. And towards the end of the middle ages, we came to one of my favorite events that I am proud of every network engineer out there that we came together to handle IP Mageddon. It was a tough time, but we came together as an industry and we said, we understand what we need to do we need to take all of those bad, bad, bad IPv4 addresses and get them out of our networks and replace them all with IPv6 addresses. And I, for one, am very proud that I do not have any IPv4 addresses left in my network. I might be lying. I have lots of IPv4 addresses in my network. How did we solve IP Mageddon? Like we solve every good problem in networking, we threw NAD at it. It's okay. You, you can smile, I know. We all solve them the same way. The Middle Ages comes and we get to the Renaissance of networking. And like the Renaissance in art and industry, it brought all sorts of excellent new ideas, but some of them were scary and challenging. We kind of needed it. Even here at Cisco, we needed software-defined networking to come in and question what we always thought we needed to do. And so we had concepts like open flow and disaggregation. Micro-segmentation came in really important. This is an exciting part for me, multi-protocol BGP. I barely understood one protocol BGP, and then we had to throw more at it. That's a bit much for me. But my favorite part about the Renaissance in uh, network engineering is VXLAN, and I'll tell you why. VLANs have been around since the Stone Age. We love VLANs. I got lots of them. I got hundreds of VLANs in my pocket, right? Do you need a VLAN? Do you need a VLAN? VLANs for you all. But VLANs have been around for a long time, and in the Renaissance, we needed a new way to segment the network. And so we came together and we came up with VXLAN, and I like it. I worked in Cisco in sales for a few years, and there's one thing I learned as a sales engineer at Cisco, is when you have a solid technology that works really well, that people love, eventually you need to pizzazz it up a little bit. And there is no better way to pizzazz up a tried and true piece of technology than to put an X in the product name. That's all it takes. Ask all the product managers at Cisco. That's all you have to do. Maybe change the color a little bit, 
stick an X in the product name, bam, millions in sales. It's fantastic. The renaissance in network engineering burned bright and fast and brought a lot of ideas. Some of them stuck around till today when we get to the programmable age. And so now networking is involving things like real APIs that we use in production. We're having to deal with technologies like Python and data center capabilities, net DevOps options, containers really are out there. And the cloud is still out there. Even on sunny days, the cloud is out there someplace. So with all this in mind, what is the poor network engineer to do? How are we supposed to handle this? All right, I've got my good buddy Carl here. Carl and I have been telling this story for many years, and we're constantly trying to figure out how do we navigate these challenges that we have as network engineers. When I started telling this story with Carl, we both sat down and said, I know how to solve this. We have to just buckle down and we have to learn it all. We have to become experts in network engineering. We have to become experts in software programmability and automation because we just have to do it. And we tried, Carl tried, I tried. I burned myself out many, many nights. And eventually I realized we don't have to do it alone. This transition is a team effort, right? Look at all of you out there. We're all on the same team living this together. We don't have to do it all ourselves, but we do have to figure out how to do this as an organization, as a team, as a group. Because the core networking skills of layer two and three fundamentals, security, quality of service, these are all important. We can't get rid of those. But there are new networking skills that we have to adopt. We have to learn how to do cloud and container networking. And we have to understand how to deal with the platforms like Linux and containers and microservices. It's really hard to build a network for something if you don't understand the basics of that platform. And yes, we do have to learn a little bit about data formats, programming skills, because no longer do we send just our configurations out in little CLI templates. Sometimes those configurations are in JSON or YAML data. And so we do have to learn a little bit but work together as a team and evolve ourselves. Because that I think was the biggest thing I've learned over the last five years or so is I've really kind of dived in and become an, an engineer like all of you building networks is that we can't do this all alone. It is a team effort. I'm also really excited to be in learning and certifications now because this is something that we've seen. The certification program at Cisco is one of the most popular and, and trusted in the world. And that's because we've continued to evolve it over time to support these transitions that are out there. And so a few years ago, we looked back and we launched a new way to look at Cisco certifications, where we have the traditional engineering platforms and certifications from CCNA, CCNP, CCIE. And now they've been joined with the other parts of the team that we need. If you're an engineer and you're focused on software skills, we have the DevNet certifications for software and automation skills. And security continues to be more and more important. Right, it's, it's all over here at Cisco Live, how important security is. And so we have the cyber ops certifications and programs for folks that wanna focus on security detection, analysis and response. There is so much good things that we can do and Cisco is going to be here to help all of you in this transition. Some of us may be those uh, really hard to find unicorn engineers that get to pick them all up. Not me, right? Sometimes you gotta focus in on a spot and that's okay. And that brings us to where kind of the start of our talk. How do we bring programmability into network engineering? Here's one of my favorite slides in this, right? I always, whenever I see this, I see Carl back there with this look on his face. And I like to think this is like a Monday morning after a change window. We've all been there. Those are tough mornings, right? It probably went well. I figure Carl was able and with his team to get it all to go through, but there were a few things that kind of were hiccups. There always are. And he's sitting here in the lunchroom and he's looking across the way and he's like, what happened to the software guys? When I started as a network engineer, the software guys all came in like in three piece suits with ties. They were super well polished. Now the software team wears shorts, baggy clothes, hats on backwards. They got their laptops all decorated with stickers. And how the heck did they convince security to allow some guy in a costume into the lunchroom? And so Carl's sitting back there like all of us and being like, okay, there's gotta be something I can learn from that space. And that's really what we're trying to do here is we're trying to evolve ourselves to understand it. Now we can't just become software people. Software folks are really concerned about desired speed and they've really embraced pipelines and automation early because their job is to release software and applications and mobile apps and services faster than all of your competition does 
so that your customers stay your customers and not your competitors' customers. It's a slightly different world. Us in the network infrastructure space, we have to focus on acceptable risk, right? That's a, the most important we have to think about. We can't get rid of risk completely. It's always going to be there, but we have to find that acceptable risk layer. And the way that we've done that over these years is by convincing ourselves that we can handle this ourselves. We need to build run books, these nice sequential run books. We got to do this thing, then this thing, then this thing, then this thing. And then we have our, our, our coworkers check our run books to make sure, yeah, that makes sense. Then we have maybe our boss check it because we need our bosses sign off because if something goes wrong, right? Well, he said it was okay. And then we call our Cisco partner, have them check it off. Yeah, yeah, that looks good. That looks good. You call your Cisco SE, they check it off. You open a proactive TAC case, they check off your run book, right? Everybody's aware. And then you go into it and you're like, all right, you warm up your fingers, right? And you just start CLI, UI, UI, making these pieces. And every change request goes perfect, right? No, they don't. Because we make mistakes. We're humans. Particularly when most of these change requests happen at like 3 a.m., right? That's a tough time to do it. And so what we need to do is we need to recognize that we still have to focus on acceptable risk. That's not going to go away. But we can learn how to bring in things like pipelines and automation, use some of the common tools that are out there to truly evolve and be more supportive of what we're after. And we have to do this because we have to break something I refer to as the culture of fear that is all over the networking space, right? Every, every time we touch our network to make a change, I don't know about you guys, there's a part of me that like my heart starts fluttering, right? What's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? We don't get to make changes in the network very often. And so since we don't do them very often, we're not well practiced. We get maybe twice a year to touch the big things. And so everything we have to do happens in twice a year. And so this cycle starts and you build that run book, you get everybody to sign off on it. Then the day of the change request happens and you all come through and you check in with everybody, right? Your team is on, your boss is on, all of the other IT teams are there because they know that networking is just gonna screw this up because they always do. You've got the phone call going, you've got your SE that's on there, you've got TAC probably lined up. This is such an important change that your Cisco account manager even got off the golf course for a minute to like make sure it was gonna go okay. And you start diving into it. And you probably are successful, right? We're good at our jobs, right? We're all very good at our job. But at some point, something probably went didn't not quite right. And so it doesn't matter how small it is. It's, see, it's seen as a failure and it reinforces the culture of fear. And oh man, they, the network team messed it up again. We can't do that. We have to look at how we go forward so that we no longer have to find and dig out that old Catalyst 6500 from the closet before every one of these change requests, wait for the harvest moon under a cloudless night and sacrifice it in a fire of 3750Xs just to be ready to do a change. We have to embrace change. We have to become comfortable with it. We have to know how to test our changes in advance so that we aren't afraid to push them out. We have to get to the point where we're allowed to do changes so often in the network that our account manager just knows it's gonna be okay. That our CIO no longer insists on being on the conference bridge when a change is going on because we've done this week after week after week. But this is a journey that we're going to have to do. We can't get there overnight. But the power, the value, the advantages we have if we can do this successfully are huge. Net DevOps and programmability, the vision here is to give us consistent version controlled infrastructure deployed parallel with automated provisioning. I worked really hard on that vision because I think that's really what we all want. We joke about the time capsules of networking that all of our sites are, right? Oh, that site over there, we built that in aught three and if you look at it, you can see what all of our standards were back in aught three. This site over here down the road, we built that one in 2019, so it looks a little better. This one's post pandemic and God knows what's out there, right? We don't want time capsules of configuration. We want everything to be boring and the same. And we can only get there if we truly embrace automation. And it is a journey, you have to start someplace. So people always ask me, Hank, where can I start? What can I automate? What are the possibilities? And so I came up with some lists, some ideas for all of you to tackle. And I break it into three categories, deployment activities, 
configuration management, and health and performance monitoring. Three broad categories that are all of the types of things we do as network engineers. And so in the deployment space, you need to deploy a new pallet of infrastructure. We've got zero touch provisioning. You need to do upgrades. We've got swim capabilities to automatically push new software that's out there. Then there's configuration management, what every network engineer looking at automation wants to do. The hello world of network automation is how fast can I spin up like a thousand VLANs on my network? That feels really cool to push out a thousand VLANs. I told you, it all comes back to VLANs at the end, right? We want to do that. We want to see how automation can help us there. But very few customers, very few organizations actually have to spit out a thousand VLANs on a regular basis. So I encourage all of you, if you're starting in the automation journey, start in the health and performance monitoring space. And there's two really good reasons I make this suggestion. The first one is that unlike spinning up a thousand VLANs, every day we want to make sure that our network is actually healthy and being monitored. Right? That's something we need day after day after day. So we get a ton of value from those types of activities. The second reason may even be a more important reason. Configuration management or deployment activities involve touching and changing the network, changing a part of the configuration, changing how it's built out. That is a riskier thing to do. And when you're first getting into automation, you're not just learning how to configure a network for the first time. You're learning how to use APIs and programmability tools like Python or whatever your language of choice is. And it is a much better place to learn those new skills with activities that are primarily read-only activities, gathering data from your network and analyzing it. And so health and performance monitoring is a great place to learn these new technologies, these new aspects that you're after. They may not be as interesting as pushing out a thousand VLANs into your network, but they will be far more valuable and you'll build up the muscle memory and capabilities and skills in those use cases to help you in other places. Although I do know you all are excited for the full configuration management use cases. So I'll show you an example of what your future all holds. Here we've got Carl, right? He's back with us. He's sitting down to uh, implement some network change. He's still a little confused. Carl, the poor guy, is always a little bit confused, but he sits down and he opens up a new branch in his Git repository. And then he fires up his tools, whichever one is tool of choices to make this configuration change. Maybe it's Ansible, maybe it's Terraform, maybe it's Cisco NSO, maybe his team has gone super hardcore and it's pure Python, doesn't matter. He makes those changes on his laptop and then he tests that configuration using one of a number of tools that are available today for testing things right on your own laptop. Maybe it's Vagrant to manage local virtual machines of network. Maybe it's Cisco's NSO NetSim that allows us to simulate networking that's out there. Or we've got Batfish, a really cool tool in, from the open source community that allows us to actually use data modeling to understand the impacts of WAN and ACL and routing protocol changes. Lots of ways to validate these things before we even leave our own laptop. Eventually, Carl's pretty happy with this and he pushes that change up to GitLab which picks up the CICD style pipeline approach. We can then fire up a powered by Cisco Modeling Labs test network that looks just like production, as close as we can get in a virtual world. And then we use those same automation tools to push that configuration out to the test network and validate that it was successful as much as we can. Those tests run and then WebEx or your chat tool of choice can send you a message that says, hey, great job, Carl. Your configuration change looks A-OK, -okay. well done. I think you still have time to make that new movie this week that just came out. Or maybe it comes back and says, you're really close, Carl, but we, got, we found a couple of problems in your change and he can just repeat this cycle as it goes through. Getting to this point is a journey, right? A long journey. So don't feel discouraged if you're like, oh man, I don't know how I'll get there. You don't have to get here in one day. It'll take you lots of steps. Celebrate the successes along the way. And if you, like me and like Carl, are interested in learning and getting started into programmability and automation, well, boy, do I have a deal for you. We're announcing and talking about this week here at Cisco Live, the Rev Up to Recertify focused on network automation and brought to you by Cisco U. And so we have an offer for free completely off the Cisco U platform. Ooh, it went ahead. It wasn't supposed to do that. We have an offer brought to you here by the Cisco U program 
to go through and take a learning path and earn 16 continuing education credits focused on a brand new uh, set of content focused on network fundamentals and learning those pieces that are there. Apparently this slide has an automatic like advance. So every time it goes, I just keep hitting the back button. Um, if you missed a chance to scan it while you're here, we've got QR codes all over the place here in Cisco in the learning and certification booth. Check in with folks that are out there and we can help you get signed up for Cisco U and dive into this. All right, with that, I'm gonna let it actually move forward. If you've got any more questions on automation and programmability, please stay in touch. We'll be here in the Cisco learning and certification booth all week. We've got content going on. And then some, uh, before we leave, and I know I'm, oh, I actually did pretty good on time. I wanna thank you all for joining. Somewhere in one of these chairs out here is a raffle ticket attached to the bottom. So before you run away too fast, make sure you check. And if you've won, come up and see me afterwards. Otherwise, thank you all for coming to see me here at the morning on day two for how to be a network engineer in a programmable age. We'll see you all next time. Thanks, everybody. Perfect. All right, did anybody find a raffle ticket? Hi, good, good. No, no, absolutely, here, let me get this microphone.